Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining me again this morning on Next on the Tee. I'm your host, Chris Mascaro, and today I've got three great guests lined up for you to knock the dew off the tee with me as well. First up, I'm going to be talking with PGA Tour caddy and the winner of the Golf Channel's Big Break 2, Kip Henley. Kip Caddy's out on tour for Brian Gay. Things didn't go quite as planned this week up at the Greenbrier Classic in West Virginia, so we get to have Kip joining us this morning. I'll be talking to him about life on tour as a looper, what it's like, what it was like winning the big break, and looking forward to the rest of this year schedule when he joins me here in just a moment. A little later, I'll be joined by LPGA pro Missy Bertiotti. Missy was the winner of the 1993 Ping Welch's Championship in a playoff over Dottie Mockery. She's now a golf instructor up in her hometown of Pittsburgh, my hometown, and spends time helping players deal with both game instruction plus the mental side as well. So I look forward to talking with her about 20 minutes from now. Then I'll wrap up the show by talking with PGA Tour Pro broadcaster and CEO of Impact Zone Golf, Bobby Clampett. Bobby's currently playing out on the uh, Champions Tour, played on the PGA Tour from 1980 to 1995 before he turned to the broadcasting booth. He won the 1982 Southern Open and had 33 top 10 finishes out on the PGA Tour. His Impact Zone golf training aides have uh, received a ton of accolades, so I look forward to talking to him about all of that. He'll be here about 40 minutes from now. But before we get started, we want to kick off the show by saluting the brave men and women serving in our military and everyone listening in on, on the Armed Forces Radio Network. This 4th of July weekend, we also want to thank those of you who, who serve or have served in every branch of the military and public service. We truly appreciate your sacrifices that have preserved our freedoms and our liberty. It's through your strength and efforts that our way of life is even possible. Our sincere thanks as well to Sean Cruz, Stephen Lee, and all the folks at Armed Forces Radio. It's an honor for us to be a part of your network. You can find our show by going to armedforcesradionetwork.org and clicking on the sports link that you're going to find in the bottom right-hand side of the page or in the radio link in the upper right-hand corner. Please, also be sure to give those guys a follow on Twitter. You can find them at the AFRN for the Armed Forces Radio Network. All right, now joining me is Kip Henley. Kip is uh, from, uh, originally from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Just learned he spent a lot of his time also in Atlanta, here where I'm at. He won the, the uh, Golf Channel's Big Break Tour back in 2004. On top of the nationwide tour, now the web.com tour exemptions that he received for winning the Big Break, he also earned exemptions into the FedEx St. Jude Classic twice. He's currently caddying on tour for Brian Gay. If you follow him on social media, you know his Twitter posts are hilariously funny. We'll talk a little bit about that. And I'm thrilled to have him this morning with me next on the tee. Kip, good morning to you. Thanks for being here. Chris, good morning to you, little buddy. You're going to have to move your show back to the afternoon or in the evening if you're going to have me on early on Saturday morning. Just <laughs> My head's spinning, buddy. Yeah. I'm sure I'm sure the rare opportunity to get some sleep on a Saturday morning is uh, is greatly missed. My apologies to you. I, I guess golfers are up early, so I guess it makes sense to have it this early, though, doesn't it? <laughs> there you go. So, Kip, for golf fans who follow you and Brian Gay, you were up at the Greenbrier this week. Um, Brian had sort of a, a rough first round and uh, was forced to withdraw. You and I were talking just a moment ago off the air. What happened with Brian? Is he okay? Well, uh, he's okay, but his thumbs at uh, Hartford, he started having some issues with his left thumb, and it's, it wasn't a big deal at first. You know, he took some ibuprofen, but right when he changed the directions at the top, you know, it stresses your left thumb out, and uh, it kept getting sore as the week went along. And then we had a week off, and he got a lot of therapy on it. But this week, man, he was he was really whiny about it all week and uh, <laughs> in practice, and then. Uh, Thursday, it was killing him. And, I mean, I saw him hit two or three shots, and I knew then it wasn't just him being a sissy anymore. It was killing him. Because, <laughs> yeah, he, on the, uh, our next and last hole, he hit this duck hook. And I said, dude, I've been with you eight years. I've never seen you hit a shot like that. I said, I said what are we going to do? He goes, I don't know, but I want to quit. And I said, I understand, man. And it's just tough. But So, uh, yeah. he's, he's hurt, so I don't know what I don't know if he's going for the cortisone shot or therapy or just rest or what he's going to do. But 
mm-hmm. he's been he's been a healthy, tough uh, guy on the PJ Tour. I mean, he's he's in, he's in early early forties and almost no injury since I've been with him. You know, just little bitty knickknacks. And yeah, that's pretty good to play healthy that long. But not now. We got okay. trouble. Yeah. No. Well, you know, our wishes. Hope hopefully he gets better for the both of you here. You know, before long, because I'm sure, you know, something like that sticks around. It can uh, it can linger for quite a while. Hopefully, it's better soon. Yeah, we uh, so, figured it out. So, Kip. As I said in the intro, you're originally from Chattanooga. And by the way, my parents live just outside Chattanooga in the same town I think your brother Brent lives in, in Ottawa, Tennessee. Yeah. My father plays his golf at Winstone Golf Club. Have you ever played at Winstone? Uh, lots of times. I'm, I grew up with the owners. That they grew up at the, the uh, club where I grew up here in Chattanooga. And I've moved here back not too far from Winstone. We live here now back in Chattanooga. It's great to be home. Yeah, yeah. And I'm looking forward to talking to your brother next week about all of that stuff as well. Now, you won the big break, too, you know, as I said in, in the introduction, and a lot of stuff I saw online when I was doing the research for having you on the show. But what was it like for you being a part of a production like that? It was just, I mean, it was life-changing, really and truly. I was so fortunate to get chosen. I never thought I'd get chosen um, we watched Big Break one, like the half, the, the second half of it, when, when we we uh, realized what it was, and we enjoyed the show like crazy, and um, it kind of blew up on the Golf Channel, you know what they had. And, uh, right. Was like, it, yeah, you're still there. Oh, oh, okay. We got you. And uh, and the the winner of Big Break one won a one start on the Canadian tour, is all they that was their exemption. And then when right. they did the big break too, they said that the winner would get four stars in the nationwide. And I'd been in club pro business and being a decent player, I had qualified for lots of nationwide. And I'd already played in the, the uh, FedEx two or three. I played the FedEx seven times, by the way. But anyway, but I made wow. it into that. So they'll never, they'll never choose me because I've already done nationwide. So uh, the wife wanted me to do it. I wouldn't do it. And the last day, she came to me and begged me to do it, and I sent my I mean, uh, uh, you fill out a questionnaire. I made it just as funny as I could and sent it in. And they asked me to do a interview, and I thought, well, that's positive. And, uh, I drove, we drove all the way to Myrtle Beach. I found out they were interviewing 200 people there, 200 in Texas, 200 in California, 200 in Michigan, and 200 in Canada. And they thought, well, this wow. is not worth it. So I go all the way to Myrtle Beach to take my wife and my family. I'm 44 years old, so I kind of. Once I got out of the, the there and got there to the audition, I kind of separated myself from uh, most of the other normal looking stud tour, you know, young guys trying to make it on tour. Uh, I was 44, kind of fat with uh, white spiked hair, and I have a beautiful wife and two beautiful kids. So I separated myself in the beginning. So anyway, I hit 10 shots. I talked on camera for two minutes. Me and the wife and the kids got back in the car and drove home. Um, and I said, wow, what a wild goose chase that was. And uh, <laughs> uh, then um, a month later, they called me and said they were, they were interested in me being in the show. And they came and told me on film that I had been chosen. And then once we went to Vegas and it, it, we did the whole thing in 11 days, did shot the whole thing in 11 days. It was a million degrees. But uh, I was I, w- I wasn't playing great at the time, but I wasn't playing that bad, and uh, uh, I was never last. I didn't play great any day, but I never was the worst any day either. And then I got down to the final show against Double D, uh, Don Donatello, and he's a big villain. He right. really sh- showed his tail a couple times, or, and so it made <laughs> me look like a, it really made me look like a nice guy because he was such an enemy of uh, people. And, uh, so it worked out great for me. Right. That's a long story, but, <laughs> but it was life changing. I was a broke club pro teacher at the time, and I mean, I got like almost. Uh, I made, I got ten grand a uh, car, and then the four starts, and then I, uh, I had a great uh, agent, Dave Merrigy, came on board for me, and man, he got me like sixty thousand dollars in endorsements, and I mean, it just completely bailed me out of a huge trap that I made for me and my family trying to play the tour. Wow, just, yeah, that is life painting. Yeah, and then I but I flunked again, you know. I didn't play terrible, but I didn't play good. And I best tour school again that year, and I got so broke that it, 
after that next year trying again and run through all that money and being broke, um, I had to do something. That's how I ended up caddying. And yeah. people, people ask me on tour all the time, hey, Kip, you know, they'll email me or whatever, text me on the, on Twitter, Chip, how do you become a tour a tour caddy? I always text back, slunk at everything else in your whole life. <laughs> That's how I ended up being a tour caddy. The other time I want to know how to become one, I feel I'm slunk at everything else you do your whole life. That's how I did it. <laughs> That's funny. So I got I got to know, and you you talked about the final, and I and I know Don Donatello actually had a putt to win it on 18, right? He had about a 20 footer that could have won the thing for him. When you're standing there watching him, you know you know get up over that putt and whatnot. In your head, are you screaming Noonan at him? You know, hoping that you know this yeah. thing isn't gonna you know not going in. Yeah, you are, but you know if you're if you played enough golf, you. You tr- you train yourself to to say it's going in, you know. But then you know I'd had to, I'd I'd hit it in the bunker dead and blast it out to about six feet. So like you said, I'm watching him. I cannot win the match. I'm thinking best case scenario is he misses this. I got to make mine. And uh, right. And he missed it, <clears throat> but he rolled it by. I mean, he rolled it by. It was that way outside the leather. Believe me. And uh, if you ever play in the leather, it's good. But anyway. <laughs> It was probably yeah, outside yeah. the putter. It was probably even outside the putter. So I I hooped my five or six foot or whatever it was, and he stood up over the thing, and you could tell, man, it was wrenching him like crazy. And something came across me, and I decided to be a nice guy, and I said, take it up, Double D. I said, that, that's not fair to have to put that. So I don't know why I did it. It's kind of stupid. Really? By the jack. Oh, yeah, I gave it to him. It was a good size putt. It was, I mean, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't. Four foot or five footer, but it was very missable under the circumstance, and the greens were kind of rough. But I don't know why I did it, but I gave it to him, and <clears throat> then I got him in the second playoff hole. Right. He said I ruined it. He, he said I ruined his life that day. <laughs> <laughs> He's my boy, and by the way, I love Don Donatello. He's one of the most intense. I mean, he caddies on tour now, and I mean, he's just a great dude. But he's an intense, yeah. fiery character. They didn't have to play him up on the show. He's just that way. All right. So, as you mentioned, you, one of the things you got, you, you, you earned a spot in the FedEx St. Jude. I know your boy Brian Gay played in that event as well. Were you hoping to get paired with Brian so you could show him how it's done? Yeah, I was hoping to on Saturday. I know I wouldn't get paired with him because I'd be paired with the guys, but the rookies that are on tour because of the categories on the tour. But, the dumbest thing in the whole wide world is I, I didn't get in the FedEx over the, the big break. I had won the Tennessee section the uh, year prior, and, and that would give me the exemption into the FedEx. It wasn't from the big break. They just gave me four starts nationwide that I ruined. But, um, right. but I was in that from the, uh, being the section champion. I just, we, we had a week off uh, in between tournaments the, the summer before, and uh, or in the fall of the year before, and I went and played in our Tennessee section. I'm, I'm still a club pro and everything, affiliated with the section. And I got, I mean, I just caught lightning in a in a bottle and won uh, our section. I mean, I hadn't shot under mm-hmm. par in like a year, and I shot 10 under for three rounds at uh, Council Fire, which is a good, tough track. And I don't know how it happened, but it did. But anyway, so going back to the the Memphis, uh, Memphis BG, here's the here's how clearer thinker I am. BG had won the year before. I was he was the defending champion. And I'd made a hundred thousand dollars caddying for him the year before at FedEx. So Wow. I yeah, that's how stupid I was. So I decided I'm gonna go play and I know unless something really happens, unless God comes down and touches me, I know I'm not gonna make the cut. <laughs> but it's gonna be a great week, you know, laughing at all the caddies and going in player dining and waving out the window to all the caddies out in the sunshine, you know, and they're eating. And uh, I knew it would be a special week, and my daughter caddied for me, Stormy. And, uh, oh, it was so much fun. But, Lord, did I play so bad. I was so bad. In fact, <laughs> at the uh, on Wednesday, uh, you know, I'm sitting in there with Ernie Ells and all the players. We're all just 100 of us in there eating and player dining. It's just beautiful, you know. And I stood up, and I said, hey, I'd like to make an announcement. I said, us players, I said, as us players, I think uh, we need to start letting the caddies come in here and eat with us and 
player dying, <laughs> but but we need to start it next week, and then everybody's <laughs> laughing like crazy. <laughs> That's great. Uh, it was a good time. But I shot 81.79, and I putted like Ben Crenshaw on steroids. I made it from everywhere, but I hit it so bad. I mean, I played with this one guy. He he is a bloodhound at finding golf balls. He found my ball two or three times where a, uh, a dog could have found it with a pork chop tied to it. It was oh, it was <laughs> awful. I I hit it so bad, it's, but I had a blast. It's, 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 as the story goes, I saw the picture that following that you wrote to uh, you left for the players that said, "Dear PGA Tour players, I Kip Henley vowed to never step into your arena as a participant again." Regrettably, Kip Henley. <laughs> that was that's, great too. That's funny. Uh, uh, little Richard Johnson, he he saw it first and and sent it out on in the Twitter world, and Zach twittered it, right? And, uh, Two weeks later, Rory uh, McIlroy saw me somewhere, and he pulled me on. He said, dude, that is the funniest thing I've ever seen. So it went over good with the third guys. <laughs> yeah. Now, speaking of, of your Twitter feed, hilarious stuff. If people aren't following you out on Twitter, they need to be because your stuff is absolutely hilarious. I particularly like the one where you said your friend U- U- Ubanic, Ubanic Mark, Told you yeah. that uh, you need a breathalyzer on your Twitter send button. <laughs> yeah, um, I couldn't wait. I said, "You know what tweet that? You want me to?" I said, "That's funny." He, he said, "Go ahead." And that's so I gave him props for the line. It was funny <laughs> as it could be. Then I've had a lot of good ones. My, I, I think. Oh, no doubt. My, 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 most people's favorite is the one where we were we were tweeting back and forth about golf courses and then. I tweeted, I said, here, here, here's the greatest hole I ever played. And uh, I had a picture of the wife when he opened it up. <laughs> Everybody went crazy. It was that a was picture of what? My wife. No, my wife. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, yeah, I got to find Everybody out. Everybody thought it was going to be like 18 at Pebble Beach or something. But right. My wife came. She kind of got sore at me for that one, but she got over it. I imagine she did. <laughs> so I also like the one where you say downtown Baghdad on market day is safer than the chipping green on pro-am days. So get, oh, my Get God. a little dangerous out there? Oh, and, and if it's got a bunker, it's even more dangerous. You just don't get in front of it. I mean, those guys are firing balls through there like crazy. They're surprised want to go over there and chip, so i got to go up on the the green and uh, you know knock his brand back to it, his brand of balls back to it. And man, they're just firing, they're zipping by your head. I mean, you really you think um, it's tough. And uh, <laughs> and I'm worried about golf balls. And this is on armed forces. Then <laughs> those guys would just love to have <laughs> golf balls shot at them. So we're grateful for our armed forces. And how big, <laughs> how tough a man and woman do you have to be to sign up for what goes on now in the world? You got that in front of you, and we're so grateful. Yeah, absolutely right. Awesome. So, so Kip, who who are some of the guys on tour when you when you and Brian get paired with them? Sort of golf aside, that you know it's going to be a fun couple of rounds. Oh man, let's see. Um, it's fun. You know, there's there's a couple of guys. I won't. I can't name names. I can name a couple of the great ones. You know, like Carl Peterson. I mean, he's just such a, a pleasant guy to be around. And, and some of the big guys you get paired with, Nicholson, I mean, he won't, just because you're a caddy, he won't stop talking to you. You know, a lot of the guys look at you like, why are you talking to me? You're just a caddy, you know, and you just, you just want to just bully this for the rest of their lives. But, um, <laughs> it's, Nicholson's one of my favorite guys to go out with. We don't get to do it very often, you know, we don't get paired up with him very often, but he's cool. I mean, if you ask him what time it is, he tells you how to make a watch. But he, he, he <laughs> he's really a great guy. I mean, he that is no put on. That guy is awesome with the fans. He is the best out there. And uh, all uh, these young guys, right I need to look and see how this guy does it. So you, you you talk about you know some of the players perhaps looking down on you as a caddy, and you talked about being in the lunchroom with the players. But you know, which tournaments out there actually treat the caddies the best? Uh, the, uh, the, what's the one in Charlotte, Charlotte, the Wells Fargo, they right. are the, they are the bar. They, man, they valet us 
in front of the clubhouse. We have our own chefs that cook out in the tent next to the, our tents located right next to where the players come out of the clubhouse. And I mean, they give us tickets, and I mean, it's just. But now, really and truly, when I first came out, that was the one thing I bitched about like crazy eight years ago. I'd go, golly, you're kidding. We don't even have a tent to go inside if it's raining and stuff. And I go, why is that fair? And um, I really kind of, uh, not. You know, I'm, I'm not saying I was the reason, but, boy, I was one of the loudest voices in the beginning. It's not fair for us to be treated like this. We should be able to get somewhere right. out of the, the the temperature or the rain or the lightning. And uh, uh, they should just, and now, man, every tournament around board, there's, everybody's stepping up now. There's just one or two left that treat us poorly, and I, don't, I won't name names. But uh, it's amazing how much better the treatment is out there. Well, at least that's good. Yeah, I, I hate to I hate to think that there are there are A players and B events that still you know we're in, you know it's 2014 for crying out loud we're still treating caddies <laughs> like second class citizens. Come on, man. Yeah, it, it's it still happens, little buddy. But it's getting worse, less and less. Hard for they even do our laundry for us. You know, we can take they dry clean our clothes. Uh, I mean, there's so many of them that are really getting good and treating us fairly now, and it's nice. Yeah, I bet it is. That's great. I'm glad to hear that. So, right before we let you we, before we let you go, Kip, what's what's on uh, tap for the rest of the season? I know we got the British Open coming up next week. Uh, where are you and BG headed uh, here in the next few weeks? Uh, well, we got uh, we got one last shot at qualifying for it. Um, it's the uh, the John Deere next week up in Moline, and you can't get there from here in Chattanooga where I'm at. Good months, the flights are like seven hundred bucks, the cheapest. One way ticket in. Wow. And to, yeah, I don't know how how we're gonna get up there. Yeah, I don't know if me and my brother may drive or what we're gonna do. But uh, John Deere's next week, and and uh, we looked ahead in the temperature because that place can get hot, man. You know. I bet it can. And a, oh, and it's a tough, tough track to walk. I mean, they got tons of uphills on that place, and um, but I just looked ahead, and it looks like the high is going to be maybe in the low 80s next week. So that's a huge blessing for the caddies next week. So I hope Brian's yeah, thumb filled up. I hope his thumb filled up well enough to take off and and play and still make it into the British Open. We'll see. All right. Well, the best of luck, Kip, to you, to to Brian, and uh, I can't thank you enough for uh, getting up early on a Saturday morning, <laughs> uh, a rare Saturday off for you, and and being a part of the show because uh, you made this a lot of fun. I hope you'll come back and do it again sometime. Hopefully we can find uh, another another window of opportunity with you because you're fantastic. Hey, tell tell our folks, tell our listeners how they can follow you on Twitter because, again, funny stuff. Uh, um, yeah, don't let your kids follow me because I'm a little bit past PG-13. Uh, it's at, at <laughs> Kip Henley. It's, it's that complicated. It's at Kip Henley, K-I-P-A-G-M-L-E-Y. Uh, just don't get mad at me. I like to have fun. I like to have people laugh. And little buddy, I appreciate you having me on. And when you run out of any any guests and you can't find somebody to fill your show, call Kipper. I'll talk the whole hour. <laughs> be careful what you ask for, because I just might do it. <laughs> I'd be, it'd be my honor, and I appreciate the people listening in. And, uh, everybody have a great fourth. All right. Thank you, Kip. Best of luck to you. Best of luck to Brian, and hopefully we get to catch up with you real soon. All the best. All right, guys. See you. Take care. Take care. Kip Henley. What a guy. That's funny stuff. I'm telling you, you want to follow Kip on Twitter because his stuff is hilarious. And uh, But uh, to his point, it may not be PG-13, but uh, it's great stuff. You're going to laugh if you do it, and I highly recommend him. All right, we're gonna, we got our next guest, Missy Bertiotti, hanging on the line. Get to her right after this quick station identification. This is Joe Longinusa from Thursday Night Tailgate, and you're listening to On the Tee with Chris Mascaro on the Armed Forces Radio Network. Now joining me is Missy Bertiotti. Let me give you some of uh, Missy's background. She was born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, so you know she's awesome right from the get-go. She won back-to-back Pennsylvania State Championships in 1980 and 81. She attended the University of Miami on a full golf scholarship and was a part of their 1984 National Championship team receiving medalist honors. She played 14 years on the LPGA Tour and won the 1993 Ping Welch's Championship up in Boston. She had several top 10 finishes, including in LPGA majors. 
She was the first ever women's golf coach at Carnegie Mellon University. Now she's focusing her time on golf instruction, both with the mechanics of the game and on the mental side. And I'm excited to have her joining me this morning next on the team. Missy, how are you? Great. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I hear you just fine. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Good. I, I'm having a great time listening to your show, Chris. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. So, yeah. Missy, I, when I was looking into your background, I see that you started playing the golf at age 10. Who sparked your interest in the game at such a young age? You know, it's so funny. I'm a mother now. I have a 15-year-old son. And as a parent, maybe an older parent, I started later. I had a little bit more time, maybe a little bit more money. I would have done anything to expose my kid to anything he wanted. And when I started, how I started was my dad played. My dad was a typical amateur, not very great, you know, just average. And I said, Daddy, I want to play with you. You know, he said, No, you're not good enough, honey. You can't play. You're not good enough. Butt off. <laughs> and you know, wow. I had nothing. And these kids today probably have way more than they need. And uh, so, it's, who knows how to motivate kids? But that sparked me, and I wanted to get good enough to play with my dad and his friends. Ah, good for and, you. Yeah, it's funny. So. Now you're playing out, I read it, at, at both Rolling Hills Country Club and the club at Nevillewood, which is, you know, just a few miles from downtown Pittsburgh. Nevillewood, you know, when I was looking out online, spectacular track. Uh, Jack Nicholas did the golf design up there. Talk a little bit about both places that you're playing, what you like about both clubs. Well, I live at Nevillewood. My family, my mom lives there. My, they retired there, my parents. It's beautiful. It's a residential community. There's great members it's an absolutely beautiful layout. It's just aesthetically, it's beautiful. It's um, you know, it's a typical Jack Nicklaus, big fairways, big greens. I, so I love that. That's where I live. But where I teach is over at Rolling Hills, on the other 20 minutes away. And at those greens at Rolling Hills, they're borderline like Oakmont. It is. I mean, Western Pennsylvania. Wow. Oh my gosh! It's yeah. There's there's. I can name you 15 courses in our town that it's, it's downright scary putting up here. It just that, you know, sloping fast. So I think it's a great, looking back now, I was really fortunate to grow up in this area playing, you know, uneven lies, hilly fairways. You learn how to play. You learn how to putt and chip for sure on the greens. So that's how I grew up. I grew up at a course called Valley Brook, and I, had, I was lucky. I had a great childhood, great parents. And I was fortunate to get on, went to University of Miami, played, won some, on the college level, won some tournaments. And then I went right out on tour and did okay. I played 14 years and then retired when I did have my son. I just didn't want to travel as much with a, you know, with a child. So I moved back home and I always thought I'd go back. But you just get in this mother mode and it's not easy. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sure it's not. So, yeah, I, Missy, you know, yeah. you, you talked about playing 14 years out on the tour. I just, you know, I think people look at athletes in general sometimes and go, you know, gee, it's a, that's easy. You, get, you know, you get to play a game, you know, for a living. Was it always fun, like playing a game for a living, or, or at some point does it turn into a job? Well, that's a great question. I, I'd say the short answer is yes, it, it turns into a job. I just finished one lesson this morning for a 17-year-old guy. They want it so badly. This, this young man, he wants to play in college and pro, and I was just like that. And, you know, I think when you're motivated and when you have a goal, I, I, yes, it's a leisure game for most of the nation. But, man, when you want to be a pro, it is nothing but a goal in front of you, and you are trying to get there. And, you know, if you shoot a 75, that's that's not going to do it. So, I, yeah, it's, we worked. The, the ladies that I played with, our era, you know, we all are we're in our 50s now, and we see each other, and we marvel marvel at our, our perseverance back then because we it took a lot. Like, I really respect um, this sounds, you know, it's, I really respect what I did now. When whereas when I was doing it, it was just absolutely normal. And these these young people I teach now, these mini tour players and young kids, I so respect the amount of energy 
and effort they put into it. It's it's definitely a job. Mm-hmm. So w- when you look back on your experiences, Miss, you can get at your hat out there. What what was the most fun about it? You know, if it does turn into a job and, and a bit of a grind after a while, what was the most fun about being a part of it? Well, that's a, you know what? It's there's there's so many things I can answer, but it's it's the just people, the relate. I mean, I have best. I mean, you go through an experience with you, with your fellow competitors, and we're still best of friends. We grew up together playing junior golf, college golf pro golf, traveling city to city to city, staying in hotels, dump hotels, adventures. We didn't have our dry cleaning done, Kip, by the way. The LPGA <laughs> Tour is right <laughs> Yeah, the LPGA Tour is right up there with caddy status. I'm I i should not say that. It's getting a I mean it, the money is not near what the men are. So did we play right. did we fly private jets? Did we have our dry cleaning done? Did we have rental cars every week? No. So you bond together. You have experiences and adventures trying to drive from, you know, San Jose to Santa Barbara where we play the tournament and the first time ever in California, the first time ever in Las Vegas. You know, you grow up. You really grow up and and travel and experience things that, you'll, you know, you'll never, never forget. So it's quite an experience and I, I wouldn't have traded it for the world. I was a finance major in Miami, and I got my degree and loved that area of business. But I've never worked a day in my life in, in the finance field. Hmm. So, <laughs> to to your point about the differences between the LPGA and the PGA Tour, I'm sure you had opportunities to to talk to guys that were out on the PGA Tour and kind of compare notes. But did you guys, you know, did you did you and the other ladies ever look at it and go, you know, wow, look those guys are, you know, going around like kings, and here we are, and it's such a drastic difference in the experiences that we get to have versus what the PGA has. Was that ever, a, you know, a, a, I guess a, a sore spot for for you and your competitors? Uh, yeah, I, I really don't think so. I think, I mean, we were certainly aware of it. There were certainly women. Myra Blackwell comes in mind right off the bat. She really pushed hard to get us daycare, like a maternity leave, first being pregnant, daycare. Like, we had to fight for basic things, and some women spearheaded those uh, those campaigns. But I don't think, I don't know if it's because we're competitors, and it, instead of complaining, we just do it and get the job done. So I think it was, like, this is the reality of the world. Let's go. Let's get to work. And we played with the men uh, once a year. We always played in the, back then, it was a J.C. Penny classic where the men and women paired together and that was so much fun i played with rocco mediate here another local pittsburgh guy and yeah you got to see, that was a lot of fun you got to see you know we never traveled with the men so we saw their games right up close and personal inside the ropes and all those superstars so that was really great i i, I loved that um, you know, we did. I, like, even with Rocco, Rocco was a nobody back then, and watching him now ascend to kind of like stardom and popularity, you see how people mature and grow up. So it, it's been a kind of a really neat, unique position to be in, playing, mm-hmm. being a part of this. I've loved it. So when you were a young golfer getting started out on the LPGA tour, was there somebody, whether it was one of your competitors, one of the, the ladies out on tour, somebody else that, you know, kind of took you aside and, and taught you, you know, what it was going to be like and how you'd be successful out on tour? Oh, I wish I could say yes. That's probably why I do what I do now. I teach this program now called the mental mastery program. I wrote a book Great. two years ago. And it's it's exactly for that. I mean, it's it's how to like how to deal with pressure, playing under pressure. How to deal with your own fear. How to you're tr- always trying to look good. You're tr- playing in front of people. Um, our high expectations of ourselves, always needing to be perfect. Nobody. It took me years to learn that stuff. How to you know learn to trust yourself. How to pr- actually practice best. You know most effectively. Um. I really didn't say I, I had some great ladies. I shouldn't say that. I, Sandra Palmer, Pat Bradley, 
Nancy Lopez was great to me. But we're all busy. We're all busy, and perhaps I'm seeing a lot of that now on the men's tour. I hear, you know, Phil's playing with Keegan Bradley, more things like that where there's an elder, you know, elder statesman kind of passing down those subtleties. Those subtleties, Chris, if you ask me, are everything. By the time we're on the tour, I know how to stand. I know how to where to put my thumb. You know, I've got all that stuff, but it's, like I said, it's how to interact, how to let go, how to quit trying so hard. And if you can have somebody that's been there, that has done that under those, that elite, you know, that high level, they, I don't think too many other people know that that well. And by the way, that guy, Kip, the caddy, he's kind of downplays and says, he plays some great golf. He he knows that (laughs) highest level. Some of, actually, I'll right. tell you what. Actually, that's a good point. You talk about it. Did anybody ever help me? Some of the caddies I had, they know the game as well as, as if not better, than the tour players because they're objective. Their emotions are less, you know, in, in, uh, what's the word, um, enhanced. They're, like, like, they're more objective. They can kind of control themselves better when you're observing as a caddy. When you're a player, you just sometimes lose it. And some of my caddies, I had some great men caddies. There's a lot of women out there too now, but I I didn't have I didn't have any women. I don't think not not regularly. Yet. But they really taught right. me how to strategy, manage my emotions. Don't get too worried. It's okay. We can that are huge. So to that end, I, I'm curious. You know, you like I mentioned in the intro, you won the 1993 Ping Welch's Championship. You beat. Dottie Pepper, Donnie Mockery at the time on the fifth playoff hole. Um, talk about, you know, your emotions and how you were able to focus and sort of stay in the moment because it took you five holes, five, five holes into the playoff to beat, you know, and Dottie finished, you know, fourth, I think, that year on the money list. So she was a very prominent player. You're coming up and you, and you get that win. How were you able to, you know, focus, not get ahead of yourself and stay in the moment? Well, that is a great question. Yeah, I beat Dottie in a five-hole playoff. I wasn't even scheduled to play that week, but I had met with my sports psychologist the week prior. His name was Bob Rotella, who's still out there helping a lot of players. And I just I, – I was able to understand from him that week how to get in a good mood and not let the shots, you know, the good or bad shots, which is every second pulling you. You know, it's like a big temptation – but just stay grounded, stay relaxed, stay happy. And I did. I just went up there and I just wanted to play. I didn't get caught up in any, uh, you know, disappointment. And my caddy was tired, and I said, come on, Danny, get going. Like, oh, there's, you're like I'm not quitting. You know, you know this is easy. <laughs> this is fun. But, but uh, it was a really nice week for me. That was the, the one victory of my LPGA career. I played well a lot a lot of top fives, a lot of top tens. But it seems like it took so long to get to that winner's circle. Something, Somebody always did something heroic. So that was a really neat breakthrough. And then really shortly after that, I got pregnant and had my son and just kind of, you know, started going in different directions. So I, I feel fortunate to have, you know, broken through whatever I've accomplished out there. It was really great. It was just a great privilege so what from that experience of having you know one on the lpga tour you know staying in like you say being able to stay in a good mood from you know you you teach a lot about the mental side of the game which you which you've talked about already but what what from that experience are you able now to hand down to the to the kids that you're teaching so that you know hopefully they can handle that pressure or handle that moment better than uh, than they might otherwise yeah, I love being able to do that. That's what I feel like. If there is any point to me having gone through all that, and I'll say some, I'll I'll say it, but a lot of heartache, you know, a lot of heartache. Um, if there's any point for me having gone through all that and learning all I learned to deal with that, it it is to help these guys, these younger generation, go quicker, you know, get quicker to their goal without having to you know, hurt so bad. I mean, lessons are learned by disappointments. I I think there's a lot of value in that, but you don't have to do it over and over again. So pass that on. 
I think maybe my, my book tries to outline it. I think I tried to write from a competitor's point of view, a player's point of view. It's not a theory. I mean, I spent years with sports psychologists, workshops, seminars, and stuff like that. And then when I retired, I studied it even more formally. So I broke broke it down to more like how like how do you do this right now today on the range? Like what type of putting drills? What type of driving drills you can do with your driver game to improve that so it works and holds up under pressure? And I explain that to them. I have little little like uh, lectures right before the the lessons, not lectures, little group things we do. And it, it, it really helps. I never heard about those concepts until I, you know, learned on tour by just instinct. So these kids learn about it when they're 10, 12, 15. I mean, that's huge. Mm-hmm. No, agreed. What yeah. A, yeah, I want you to I want you to talk, you know, in a minute, Missy, about all the things that people can find on your website that are there. And I signed up and downloaded. You've got a, a free daily training schedule. And, and I've had the privilege – to talk with Gary Player a few times, and he always talks about how most golfers spend too much time, you know, on the practice range, you know, with their drivers. Right. The, the majority of the game, and where we amateurs lose strokes, is you know from a hundred yards in. And you seem to follow that same philosophy, philosophy, because your schedule has the majority of the time being spent pitching and chipping and putting. Talk about that. Yeah, isn't that a great training schedule? I that, absolutely. That's one of the, yeah, one of the men I work with now on the mental side of the game is Dr. Rick Jensen. He's another sports psychologist, and his partner is Henry Brunton. And we we work on that a lot. Like, what is optimal? How like to go out there and bang balls for eight hours? It doesn't really accomplish you know the goal. It, it might give you tendonitis. Brian Gay has this thing on his I think he said his thumb. I mean that happens right. more than more than young smaller persons but yeah you have to you have to know what you're doing to to get to your own goal it just takes too long sometimes and sometimes it just it'll just for injury or disappointment or just like you give up on yourself you think you're mentally you know a loser because you failed but really what it is you're not mentally a loser you just have never been taught how to practice and that training schedule in it, uh, an attempt to teach people, like, here are the different segments of the game. We all know there's chipping, putting, but, okay, so inside the chipping section of the game, how should I practice? Like, what do, you, what do I do? Should I hit the same chip over and over? Should I change the lot? Should I change clubs? Should I chip somewhere on one foot? What does do those type of drillings hurt, help? Things like that. A little bit of mechanics right. and a little bit of mental for each practice session. So you can Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's you, great stuff. Yeah, thank you. I I like I said, I wish I I think I first saw that sheet of paper when I was thirty five, maybe. Actually older. But I mean to have <laughs> had that when I was like I said, fifteen, oh my gosh. Who knows? Right. We've yeah. got, I've got my next guest, Bobby Clampett, hanging on the line, Missy, but before we let you go, I want you to tell tell our folks you know, how can they find you online? Talk about your website, what they can find on there, and, uh, you know, how they, any place else that they can follow you on social media. Right. Well, com is my website. I'm Missy Bertiotti on Facebook. And my my book is on there. I have an audio book on there now, too, which is, I think, a little bit easier sometimes for, for kids who don't like to sit down. But I, I travel a little bit. I work with some uh corporate women, business women who want to golf. They're kind of a little reluctant to join the business golf circles of their typically male dominated, you know, businesses. And I love working with those ladies. They're sharp, articulate, bright ladies. And they understand these concepts. And they it like kids, us adults, we same type of coaching. So I think that's that's what I like doing. I like connecting with people and making sure they understand and then going to work. So, um, yeah, <laughs> missybirdyard.com, read my book, call me. I'd love to help out however. I love Bobby Missy, Clampett's you're... book, by the way, too. I really like that book. Nah, man. Lot. That's great. Yeah, I'm, I read I'm sure he's listening to them. Great. Yeah, I read, I read so, all that stuff. I loved it. 
Missy, it's, it's been so wonderful talking with you this morning. I also want to give a quick shout out to our friend Kelly Hanna for getting us yes. together. I hope I hope you'll come back and, and join me again sometime. I'd love to keep in touch and have you back and share more of your stories from your time out on, on tour, plus, uh, you know, maybe a, a tip or two for us amateurs that need it, uh, particularly uh, on the mental side, because, you know, a couple of my favorite quotes are, you know, from uh, Bobby Jones and uh, – Ben Crenshaw, who talked about how, you know, golf was a game play and on a five inch course, you know, between our ears. So uh, yeah. we can all use, you know, some help there, but thank exactly. you for being here. <laughs> Chris, thank you very much. And have a, I'll be listening to the second half of the show. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you, Missy. All the best. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Missy Bertiotti. And uh, just so you can find her online, make sure, let me me spell the last name for you. It's E-E-R-T-E-O-T-T-I. Missy Bertiotti, check her out. Uh, We'll get to our next guest, Bobby Clampett, after this really brief station identification. You're listening to On the T with Chris Mascaro on the Armed Forces Radio Network. Now joining me is PGA Tour Pro Bobby Clampett. Let me remind you, let me remind you about Bobby's rich background, and this is only a part of it because it's fantastic and, and, uh, and well-deserved, well-earned. He's from Monterey, California, played his college golf at BYU, where he was a three-time All-American and won the Fred Haskins Award, which is college golf's equivalent to the Heisman Trophy, and he won it twice. He was elected to BYU's Hall of Fame in 1990, Played on the Walker Cup team, the World Cup team, and the NCAA All-Star versus Japan squad and was named MVP. His victory at the Eisenhower Cup World Amateur made him the number one ranked amateur in the world in 1978-79. That year, uh, the USGA named him Amateur of the Year. He left BYU having won 32 titles. Played on the PGA Tour from 1980 to 1995. He won the 1982 Southern Open by two strokes over Hale Irwin. He has finished in the top 10 33 times on the PGA Tour. He's currently playing out on the Champions Tour, where he's having a lot of success. He's made the cut in all but one tournament since joining that tour back in 2010. And he started his own company called Impact Zone Golf. And I am completely honored to have him with me this morning next on the tee. Hi, Bobby. Thanks for joining me. Hey, good morning, Chris. It's great to be with you, and great especially to to be here in celebration of our nation's anniversary with our Armed Forces Network, and a shout-out to all our troops out there listening. And We're thinking about you, we're praying for you, and we're so proud of everything you guys are doing. Yeah, that's exactly right. Bobby, be, before we talk about your playing career, I, I want to start off really by talking about your company, Impact Zone Golf. I want to give you some time to talk about it because there's some great stuff, you know, that you have online. I was, as you heard, just talking to Missy Bertiotti, who after 16 years on the uh, LPGA Tour turned, turned her focus to golf instruction. And that's sort of what you've done with Impact Zone Golf. Uh, but what I find fascinating is you're more focused on the impact position rather than just swing style, right? Exactly, Chris. Yeah, I, I had this aha moment years ago after a uh, long career, and and tell you what happened to me. You know, you you mentioned all those things that I did in my career. If you noticed, everything was 1982 or before, and that's that's uh, after that. 1983 is when I left my longtime instructor Ben Doyle, and started seeking the advice of the so-called best instructors that golf had to offer, and. Quite frankly, the first one I went to said, you know, my swing looked like it had more moving parts than an erector set. (laughs) And he wanted to make some major changes. So I did that and quickly became a three handicap. And the next fellow then looked at me and he said, listen, if you want to get better, you've got to empty your mind, forget about anything you've ever learned about the game, and start all over. Wow. And I was dumb, dumb enough to believe him. And the bottom line is I never cracked the top 80 ever again. And it led to a broadcasting career. And while I was at CBS, I had an aha moment using our BizHub Swing Vision camera. And studying the best players of the world, I realized that there's a myriad of different swings out there. Jim Furyk has a really upright swing, an unusual grip, a funky setup. Jack Nicklaus was upright. Ben Hogan was flat. Lee Trevino takes it outside and loops it and is shut at the top. 
Uh, Corey Pavin is wide open at the top and takes it inside. Uh, and it, you just go, some have big shoulder turns, some have small shoulder turns, big hip turns, little hip turns. Yet when you go take a lesson, all the pro wants to talk about is your style of swing. Mm-hmm. And I, as I realize it, you know, Bubba Watson's leading the, the FedEx Cup points right now and the Ryder Cup points. And as I, with such a, a weird style of swing, a home built golf right. swing, really. And yeah. my aha moment was this and studying the Biz Hub, which is really an amazing piece of equipment came to realize that all these pros create impact exactly the same way. And they have their own style and way to do that. And why are we creating and teaching golf? Why are we telling people there's only one way to do it or there's a best way to do it when all that really matters is impact? And then when I started to study what amateurs do at impact, I started to see a huge difference and what amateurs do at impact versus what the pros do. So I I wrote the book, The Impact Zone, which is the five dynamics of how to create impact like the best players of the game, regardless of your style of swing. And I had no idea that what would ensue would happen, but it it set out a a ripple into the world of teaching and the comments and news emails and everything that started to come. So my wife and I looked at each other and said, you know, we've got to help the game. We've got to help people understand what really matters in golf. It's not style of swing. It's it's how to create impact and get people teaching this way. So we we actually incorporated and made, uh, developed impact-based teaching and licensed our, our teaching and created a, certification program for instructors and have just grown this uh, out of uh, the book where we now have a six-volume DVD series. We're doing golf schools all over the country. And right. we have uh, we have a university that's licensed to teach all their students our way of teaching. First Tee has incorporated our teaching into their coach's manual. Uh, the PGA is really supporting uh, the teaching and the studies that I've done. And I became their first tour player in their history to be a a master instructor with the PGA. So these are just some of the bullet points of what has happened as a result of impact-based teaching. But more importantly, it really is satisfying to me to see literally thousands of people, uh, feedback that people have, some even getting ready to quit the game and suddenly see a, a whole new way of approaching the game that makes sense and it's easy to understand and figure out and before the game was so complex and left them in such a state of disarray and now they, they have a clear vision of what they want to do and how to play and when they hit a bad shot they know why and that's what right. is the real difference yeah and, and you know as, as I did the research, you know, for you coming on, Bobby, not only is, do I like the fact that, you know, you've got books and CDs, but like you said, you've got also, you've got golf schools, you've got online lessons, you've got instructors all over the country. And one of the cool things on your site is that you can actually buy a live Q&A session with you, right? You right. can you can do it once a quarter. You can get online with you. A group of folks can get online with you and uh, and actually ask you questions. That's fantastic. Well, we're trying to make ourselves as available to the public as possible. We just launched a whole new program that's completely free called Clampett's Corner, and we field a question from our uh, basically fan group uh, a week and answer a question in video format, and it's free. And that's uh, you can go to our website, impactzonegolf.com, and sign up for that. And we continue to... Uh, or clampettscorner.com. And Man. we just like to do life of fun things and get ourselves out there to to the people so that they know who we are. We're different. We are changing the game the way it's it's learned and taught, and it's going to take a while because, quite frankly, everybody's got embedded in their head, keep your eye on the ball, keep your head down, and that's all that really matters to swing a golf club. And 
<laughs> if it were only that easy, Bobby. Well, and, uh, you know, as, as, as we learn with where impact is and swing bottom needs to be four inches in front, and for every inch that your swing bottom is behind, the four inches in front equates to four shots around on your right. handicap. Uh, and so looking at the ball and staring at the ball and keeping your head down doesn't do anything to help your swing bottom. And so it's, that's usually costing the average person about 24 to 30 shots around. And that uh, right. doesn't need to be that way. Ben Hogan once said the average golfer should be able to break 80. A game's not that hard. It's just we've been indoctrinated into thinking the right way to swing a golf club, and it's not the right way. Boy, if the average golfer was able, should be able to break 80, you know, then uh, that's that's an interesting uh, tidbit for a guy who's been playing the game since I was 12 years old. So I've been playing the game for for almost 40 years now, and uh, I've broken 80. I can I think count on the, the fingers of one hand. So there's clearly something that. Uh, that needs to change for me to uh, be able to say that, uh, you know, to, to, to your point, get to where Mr. Hogan thinks we should be. So uh, yeah. I've signed up on your, on your, on your site. So I'm hoping that that's, that moment's going to come again real soon. Great. Well, we have, I can't tell you the testimonials that we had. Uh, just one fellow just wrote me yesterday and came to one of our two day golf schools and his handicap's gone from 11 to six in the last four months. Wow! Uh, right after right after the golf school, and you know we constantly get feedback uh, of people who, and what really brings me joy is people who are getting ready to quit. They were so frustrated, yeah. and I've had numerous students uh, that were this way, and some did nothing more than order the DVD system, and in the DVD system, I actually take them through the four steps, which is the the last of the four pack of the main DVD system, and take them through the four steps of how to create impact, how to do it on their own. Take them in the sand bunker and teach them the tic tac toe drill, and let them. It's a self study, and many people are able to take that just that simple message, and have it do wonders for them. I, I had one one fellow who did this who had been playing golf 17 years. He had never broken 90, and he played four days a week, and now he's he's 80 years old. And he comes to me, and, and I showed him the, the tic-tac-toe drill and showed him the sand and challenged him to just do it for an hour, one hour before his next round, and see what yeah. happens. And so he went out, and he did it for an hour, and got out and played, and he called me back, and he said, guess what I shot? And I said, what? And he said, you know, I play with the same 20 guys every week. None of us have ever broken 90, and I shot an 87. Wow. I said, that's fantastic. He calls me back two weeks later. He says, I've been doing it some more, and I just shot an 85. And he said, my short game's not very good, and I really need some work on my short game. I think I can break 80. And he's 80 years old. That's great. Yeah. That's great stuff. Good for you, Bobby. So, I want to I want to kind of get get some some pieces of your career and talk a little bit about the experiences you had out on tour as well, Bobby. I'm curious as as a guy who has been around the tour, whether it was as a player or as as a broadcaster for what 34 some odd years at this point. Did did anyone come to you when you were a young kid and try to help you or give you some piece of advice? that actually stuck with you that, that made some piece better or helped you, you know, out on tour or the lifestyle on tour or that sort of thing? Hmm. Well, I've had lots of, of great mentors uh, on the tour. You know, one of the, the benefits of, of playing well early in your career, and I'd, I'd already played uh, three U.S. Opens and two Masters before I turned pro. And right. You know, had the privilege of all my practice rounds uh, playing with Johnny Miller and Billy Casper. And then early years on tour, Jack Nicklaus took a liking to me and we spent some time together. I remember one thing Jack told me as we were, I was 18 years old and we were playing the back nine of Augusta National on a Wednesday before the Masters together. 
No, uh, just the two of us. It felt like nobody was around, but there were about 10,000 people watching us that day. <laughs> right. And we got into a nice conversation as we were walking down the fairways, and I asked him the question, if you had to do your career all over again, what differently would you do about your career? And he said to me, he says, I would stick to what I do best, and that is playing golf. Which what he meant by that is not get so distracted with all these other businesses. And what really stuck to me about that was keeping your focus, keeping your vision in mind of what it is you want to accomplish, what it is you're best at, and sticking to that and not allowing the other things that can so often swallow you up and take away so much time to intrude into your life. And that was a really important piece of advice. One of the things, and I'm, I've been a huge Jack Nicholas fan my whole life, and when you talk about all the teachers sort of getting in your ear as a young player and getting out on tour, you know, one of the things that um, I've heard Mr. Nicholas say many times is, you know, sort of owning your own game and, and knowing how to, you know, fix yourself. And now, you know, players have, you know, the sports psychologist and they, you know, have teacher to teacher and so many people telling them what to do and that sort of thing. Is that really, is, is that something that is, uh, I want to, you know, for guys who do it, I want to say it's a problem. But you've, you've, when you've got that many people in your ear all the time and someone trying to fix your swing and tell you what to think, and, and, and it's not you anymore. It's it's sort of a team of people. Is that is is that something that you've got to be very careful about as a player, letting too many people get in your ear? Absolutely. And I'll tell you, what you're bringing up, Chris, is a really, I think, vital uh, history about golf and how we teach golf and and two different segments of golf. You've got PGA Tour players, the best players of the game. And then you've got the PGA of America teachers and how they teach the game. And what has happened over time, and this is one of the things my goal is to try to bridge this gap and bring the two together, because there really is two different approaches to the game from each segment. The Tour players understand they know that they have to they have to put food on the table for their family, and they've got to figure right. out a way to shoot sixty eight or sixty nine when their swing doesn't feel very good and they figure out a way or when they're injured and they figure out a way to swing to hit the ball well and score when they don't feel mm-hmm. like it or it doesn't feel good. And right. and so they understand that they to do this and to do this in pressure situations, you have to be able to do what comes naturally. You can't manufacture somebody else's swing and expect it to perform in the heat of competition. You have to, as Nicholas has said, as Palmer has said, you have to own your own swing. Right. Yet, yet the the world of teaching professionals has gone a different direction and said, "Oh no, there's a best way to swing the club, and it's this way." And listen to me. Right. And so this is when people go to take lessons; they get this conflicting uh, view. And what I would like to see happen is for instructors to get more focused on understanding that the purpose of the golf swing is to create good impact. Right. And there's a myriad of ways to do that and a myriad of ways to do it in a powerful move. And right. to not be stuck in a, oh, this is the only way to do it mentality because we're all so different. And we have right. our bodies are so different and we're made up so differently that you can't you can't put us all into one box. Well, and, and to that point, Bobby, I mean, even if you go back in history and you look at the big three, you look at, you know, Jack, Arnie, and Gary, I mean, they all swung the club very differently, right? But oh, to your point, I imagine if you, if you slowed down their swings, that the impact piece is very similar, but they, the way they got there was com- three completely different ways. Absolutely. You know, you had... Nicholas was upright and a little open. You had uh, him across the line. You had Palmer, who was 
uh, a little shut at the top and really held it off. You had uh, uh, more of a hitter kind of kind of attitude, and then you had Gary Player, who was flatter, more rounded um, in his his approach. So three very different golf swings, and if you add what I consider the big four at that time, Lee Trevino, now you got a whole even bigger cat. Right. Right. So, Bobby, thinking about your 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 tour days, when you when you were out playing out on tour, were who were some of the guys that when you got the pairing sheets and you know for whatever tournament it was that you really knew that this was going to be a fun round of golf because I'm paired with so and so or so and so. Well, that's one of the the blessings of being on the Champions Tour full time these days, and uh, I'm in my fifth year, and having gotten reunited really with some of my really good friends and good buddies that I had some of those experiences with. Uh, you know, I remember oh, two years ago playing in the second round. I got I was invited to play because of uh, I had four top tens in my first five tournaments starting out the season, and I was on the alternate list for the Legends of Golf. And when Tom Watson went through, it left his partner, Andy North, without a partner. And so they called me up and asked me to play. I was already set to broadcast as it was a CBS telecast. Right. And I was uh, I gladly I called CBS and asked them if I could get out of my obligation to broadcast, and they let me go and uh, went to... Uh, which they didn't invite me back to do that tournament again, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I got to play with uh, with Andy North. And in the second round, I had just a magical day. I was paired with two of my very closest friends, Bernhard Langer and Tom Lehman, who were a team. And Bernhard and I, who we spent a lot of time together, we ski together, we've done things over the years together, and and uh, he and I just were on this day where we're just almost birding every other hole, just about. I think through 17 holes, I had had nine birdies, and he, he had 10. Wow. And we come to the last hole, and it's a hard par four, and I drove it in the fairway, and the pin's back right, and I hit this high cut four, and you can't see. But as soon as the ball was landing, you could hear it hit the flag stick. Wow. And it was kind of a shock from the crowd, but it wasn't a – nobody knew what happened. And so I thought, well, it must have hit the flag stick, kicked off, did something. And as we walked up there, the ball actually went in the hole. Wow. And it was captured on national television. I actually put that up on my website, that shot. You can see it on our YouTube yeah. channel. And I actually got some of the raw footage from CBS that was without any of the commentary, too. And it was just one of those amazing things that here I was, our only CBS event, and they captured it right there on the 18th hole, the hole I was supposed to be in the booth on, and hit a shot like that on what I think was the best golf day of my life, making nine yeah. days and then holding out a four iron on the last hole when two of my best right. friends. So that's there's special times like that. Um, gosh, just last week we we had uh, uh, an amazing time. You know, sometimes you, you you get paired. I got paired with Billy Glasson and Steve Pate, two more of my really good friends, in the Senior Players Championship in Pittsburgh last week. And the yeah. first round, we get on the fourth hole, which is a long par four, and all of us are one under through three, so we're off to a good start. Now Steve's even two under through three. And uh, I hit it up on the, in the, about a 20-footer with a 6-iron, and Billy hits it up with a 7-iron about 40 feet. And Steve Pate holds this 8-iron from the fairway. Wow. So it's right in the hole. Well, then Billy knocks in this 40-footer, and then I knock in this 20-footer on top of him. We, we had an eagle and two birdies on what is one of the hardest holes in the golf course. And wow. And it was just one of those days where uh, I shot 67, Billy shot 67, and Steve shot 65. Wow. And, and uh, you know, stuff like that. And Yeah. I'm having a ball, as you can probably tell, playing out there. 
Yeah, that's fantastic. Good for you. Yeah. You know, Bobby, the uh, Augusta National is my favorite place on the planet. I, I've been to the practice rounds, you know, for a number of years now. And there, is, if you if you if you said to me, Chris, you know, I'll drop you off any place on the planet you like. Where would it be? And I would tell you every day of the week at the Augusta National. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing so, quite like it. No doubt about it. You, as you mentioned, you, you made several trips there prior to even becoming pro. I, I believe I was going back through the, through all of the uh, the leaderboards in the in the late seventies, early eighties, and as I recall, I think seventy nine might have been your first trip to Augusta National, and and yet you shot three rounds of seventy three and and a seventy one to finish plus two, tied for twenty third, which is very impressive for a young kid. And that's one of the you know. Premier events, obviously on uh, on the on the tour. How how as such a young player were you able to play so well? Well, I was playing really well uh, that whole season. Uh, I won five out of six collegiate tournaments that spring. Um, I had just come off a summer where I won five out of seven major national amateur titles. Um, Things were really rolling, and so I came into the tournament playing playing some really good golf. Uh, so it wasn't a, it wasn't a surprise to me um, uh, to do that, even though it was my first time yeah. here to Augusta, and I didn't know the golf course that well. But I had the privilege of, yeah. of playing practice rounds with Johnny Miller and, and Billy Casper, who were so both so generous with their wisdom on how to play the golf course and the strategies of you know when the pins left on three uh, to hit your tee shot left and always shoot up up the green. Of course, they've redesigned the hole now and put bunkers there, but in the old yeah. days you had your your the course was much wider off the tee, uh, but you really had certain points that you had to shoot to with different hole positions and it was great to have those kind of legends there to assist me. Yeah, no doubt. Um, Bobby, one more before we let you go. I'm curious, um, 1990, you get a call from someone at your alma mater, BYU, and that person says you've been elected to their hall of fame. What's that moment like? Hmm. Well, anytime you, you you get recognized for things that you've done, it's always a, a humbling experience. And and uh, uh, clearly, uh, my years at BYU, though it was short, only three years, were some great years. And I think back to the times I spent with my team and my coach, and the traveling we did, and the tournaments we played and won, and it's, it's some of the best times of my life. And Clearly, uh, to to be able to be recognized by your school uh, in that way was was a, was a great moment. Yeah, I imagine it was. That's got to be a a very humbling experience, but a great one. And I'm sure um, you know for folks who who um, who want to see it and l- learn more about your career at BYU, it's an amazing thing. I highly recommend Googling because your college career was absolutely phenomenal. I'm not sure anyone ever dominated college golf then or now the way that you did. Well, I appreciate that, Chris. It was fun. I had a uh, one of my children was actually going to high school in, in Utah and went to visit him one time and took him to BYU, and I hadn't even seen the Hall of Fame. I remember them telling me about it, and they asked me to send them some things. So I sent it to him, and he and I walked through it, and I didn't say anything to him. And he says, Dad, is that you? <laughs> <laughs> that was a pretty funny funny moment. Absolutely. Bobby, again, t- tell our listeners how they can find Impact Zone Golf online and how they can follow you on social media. Okay. Well, the first step is to go to impactzonegolf.com. That's our major website. You can sign up for the newsletter. You can sign up for Clampett's Corner on that. Um, the other way is we we do uh, uh, bobbyclampett.com has some fun things in it. But uh, the social media side, we've got the Impact Zone YouTube channel, which has got all kinds of fun free videos that you can go to, uh, some by some of our instructors. We have... Uh, 
uh, Twitter, at B. Clampett. We have uh, Bobby Clampett Live Facebook page. Uh, Bobby Clampett Facebook. Um, gosh, I don't even know where to where to where to end. It just seems like we <laughs> we're trying to do You're it everywhere. all. Yeah. Right. <laughs> But the key place is impactzonegolf.com. That's really the the head head of all the ship and where people go to get all the information, where our instructors are, where our schools are, how to get the video system, all that kind of thing. That's great stuff. Bobby, it's it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show today. I hope you'll come back and do it. Again, sometime, love to catch up with you and you know all the things that you're achieving out on the, the Champions Tour. Maybe get some updates for what's going on with Impact Zone Golf and uh, maybe some Great. more stories about what it was like in your career. Because I got I, I got a thousand questions I'd love to I'd love to ask you. Yeah, well, you did a good job and good to be with you, Chris. And I'm glad uh, our troops were are out there listening as well. We sure think about them a lot. Absolutely right. All right, Bobby, take care. All the best to you and your family, and I I look forward to catching up with you, I hope, really soon. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. All right. Take care, Bobby. Bye-bye. Great stuff from Bobby Clampett. And, again, Impact Zone Golf, great stuff on there, a lot of good lessons. Check them out. The YouTube videos are fantastic as well, and I'm telling you, if you want to be completely blown away by a guy who absolutely dominated college golf, you're going to be amazed at the things that Bobby did during his playing days at BYU and absolutely understand why he's A, in their Hall of Fame, and B, uh, was so successful early in his career. I hate to hear that so many teachers got in his head and uh, and changed his swing around because uh, he uh, hit the hit the tour running and was an absolute dynamo in the early uh, 1980s. And I hope uh, hope now out on the Champions Tour that he gets a lot of success. And I look forward to uh, following him and having him back on the show. Hopefully, like I say, before too long. All right, everyone. It's uh, it's time to put a bow on this one. My sincere thanks to Kip Henley. Missy Bertiotti and Bobby Clampett for being such wonderful guests with me on the show today. And I thank you for tuning in. I appreciate you the very most. Please check out our sister show, Thursday Night Tailgate, with me and my co-host Bob Lazari and our announcer Joe LaGenusa. You can hear us right here on the Armed Forces Radio Network as well as Blog Talk Radio, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, radio sites across the internet. You're going to find us. Please Google us and, uh, and check us out. Uh, Thursday Night Tailgate airs every, uh, every week from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. We're joined every week by legends uh, from around the NFL and the CFL. We're official partners of the N- NFL Alumni Association, also the official radio show of the Gridiron Greats organization, headed up by uh, Mike Ditka and Jerry Kramer. Uh, so please check us out. You can uh, also find us on, on uh, Facebook. Uh, you know, next on the T, Thursday Night Tailgate, check us out. Check our pages out there. Give us a like. That's important to us, too. You can also check us out online. This show, Next on the T, is nextonthetea.net and thursdaynighttailgate.com as well. You can stream or download any of our archived episodes and keep up to date with who our future guests are on there. You can download us for free from those sites. You can download us. We're a free download on, on iTunes as well on any of the show or any of the sites that I mentioned a moment ago. Please check us out. That's very important to us. Until next week, my friends, hit them straight.